Hi, Anna. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Great. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's good to see you again. So, probably go straight into it. <laughs> um, and yeah, I was just wondering if you could introduce yourself and maybe um, talk a little bit about what you do, what work you do. So I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Philosophy and at the same time also at the University Research Priority Program on Global Change and Biodiversity. Um, those are both part of the University of Zurich here in Switzerland. And so I'm an environmental philosopher focusing on environmental ethics, but also green political philosophy, for example. Um, yeah, and so both of us, I guess, are newly members of the, of the Consortium of Environmental Philosophers that has been newly created last year. And um, maybe you want to say a few words about yourself? Yeah, so I am a PhD researcher nearing the end, um, hopefully, <laughs> and uh, I'm based in the University of Leeds. Um, and broadly, I'm, I kind of situate myself in, in ecological economics, but kind of from a bit of a critical um, perspective. So kind of sitting between ecological economics and the kind of environmental philosophy and environmental humanities that the network, um, CEP, SEP, um, I suppose also kind of resonates with a lot of people's work, um, like self there as well. Um, my research at the moment is looking at kind of flooding and flood risk management. But a lot, a lot of it is about uh, environmental valuation and how you kind of value the environment in decision making. So it kind of sits between economics and ethics um, a little bit in terms of thinking about values in that way. Um, so yeah, it's quite a um, mishmash field or interdisciplinary <laughs> um, of lots of drawing lots of things like psychology, anthropology, uh, and philosophy, um, but looking at kind of human nature relationships more broadly. Um, which is, I suppose, also why I'm, yeah, really interested in your work, um, looking at sort of, I suppose, this kind of, your focus on justice, which I suppose similarly kind of sits between um, ethics or in environmental ethics. Um, I, was, I was wondering if, if you could maybe sort of explain how your work relates to kind of conservation issues um, that, that might be more familiar in today. Yeah, so exactly the way you put it rightly. So my work sits a little bit in between environmental ethics and political philosophy and kind of trying to bridge the gap and bring those two literatures together, which is developing more and more in the literature, but has been a new development during the last few years of kind of creating more conversation within the discipline to be able to then contribute further to interdisciplinary discussions. Um, and so the way I see my work you know, related to biodiversity conservation is basically, I mean, there is a people from a range of disciplines that weigh on the question why and importantly how we should pursue biodiversity conservation. And so we have obviously discussions that uh, are more familiar to most people about ecosystem services, for example, to explain why biodiversity or nature is essential for all of our lives. So they are often, you know, self-interested reasons, so to speak, are being cited for reasons why we should protect nature. And I'm coming from the environmental ethics perspective to this question, and more specifically, the tradition of analytical philosophy that looks at environmental ethics. And here we also ask questions like, for example, like, um, are there also additional moral reasons for protecting biodiversity? So for instance, one of those questions is, you know, whether non-human beings, you know, animals, plants, species, you know, whether they matter morally in themselves in this terms of, you know, independently that they're useful to us. So they might be useful to us because, you know, there are ecosystem services from which we benefit, but we could also argue, and a lot of environmental philosophers do argue, that animals and plants and so on also matter really morally in themselves, and we need to take that into account somehow. Um, and this obviously then raises questions about how biodiversity protection should look like if we take their moral standing into account. And so for my own work, for example, that means for thinking in terms of why species extinctions, you know, coming back to the point about justice that you made earlier, you know, how, why I think the extinction of a species can be theoretically understood as the outcome of an interspecies injustice. Um, so basically part of the argumentation of saying that biodiversity loss um, is something that is problematic for us humans 
for a range of reasons, but additionally, it's also something that I would argue is a result of an injustice we see towards non-human beings. So for example, as resulting from pressures on the habitat, which are problematic in several, term, in several ways. And so all of that for me, what I find interesting is then feeding that into thinking about global justice. So how do we envisage um, a just world in which we take seriously what we owe to fellow humans, as well as what we owe to our fellow living beings with which we share a planet. And so this is kind of the perspective I'm taking on this question. Um, but you come well, from similar considerations about biodiversity uh, conservation and environmental ethics. So I would be interested to hear a little bit more about which angle you take on this question. Yeah, that's, yeah, so I'll put, um, it, it's very much coming from similar sort of points. In fact, actually, I think there was one point you mentioned earlier, which I suppose would be where we kind of go off at different angles but from the same starting point. But as I'm looking at the kind of, a lot of the measures that we see in conservation and biodiversity um, sort of protection measures around things like ecosystem services, for example, um, are often, uh, have been based from a kind of um, economics perspective, which is, um, based on these assumptions around how we value the environment um, and which uh, traditionally in neoclassical economics um, has been about self-interest. Um, so that's where, but that's that's the kind of point where I would go off at a different angle, which is to kind of challenge those assumptions. So there's lots of work in ecological economics um, around this idea of value pluralism. So um, let's go back to this neoclassical economics idea is that that there's an assumption that humans as a kind of homogenous group or, the, or particularly actually this kind of economic man um, is this, idea, this, this agent who values based on self-interest and utility, uh, so the usefulness of, of things to, to that person. Um, and so uh, value pluralism kind of challenges this and says, um, maybe we don't value um, all things according to our self-interest and we don't we don't also value just according to utility of, of something of usefulness or something um so there might be broader reasons and particularly in the, in the context of the environment where it's a, it's a shared public um good or public space that affects multiple people um and affects a group socially then obviously then usually we we consider things more than our self-interest so we might be regarding other people or we might be putting other other people's interests or, or an animals interests ahead of uh, or alongside our own so this opens up valuing to be a kind of much more plural um and also uh, complex <laughs> process so that's the kind of the point that we that, that i'm interested in and i suppose ecological economics veers off a little bit from from these kind of um uh, the, the questions that, you, that you're sort of uh, pursuing um, but it's also, I think, really exciting as well because it, it um, brings in all these different kind of ethics, ethical sort of tensions about how we, uh, the human nature relationships, that it's not just instrumental value. So it's not just this idea that the environment is good for us or useful for us alone as humans, um, but also kind of gets into the, the kind of more um, context specific human nature relationships. So it might be cultural um, factors that influence how we value, might be social groups that affect how we value, but also in terms of the actual valuation processes, which conventionally have been quite technocratic or technical in terms of um, working out how the, the values of a, a resource to, to a group of people, there might actually be the process that we use to understand those values might also affect how we value. So even discussing, deliberating, um, and those sort of more democratic processes can actually affect um, the way that people understand um, the environment to be important or to matter. So those are the kind of, so that's this kind of um, t taking economics and sort of criticizing or developing it in a way that can be potentially actually might be more reflective of, of, of actual human nature relationships is, is the, the broad aim. But it is, yeah, quite complex as well, which is, uh, growingly in a, in a more and more actually is being embraced this kind of complexity um but also can make it sometimes a bit more difficult for for sort of quick fast decision making which again um so going back to the kind of neoclassical economics has conventionally been sort of cost benefit analysis so it's always been what are the costs of an action versus the benefits that we can receive um 
but that, as we know, um, well, often people know it can often cut, leave out a lot of, of things in decision making. So the environment is very much um, often sidelined and not considered or excluded in those um, just to make just decision making contexts. So considered externalities. Um, so a lot of the work I'm particularly interested in is how do we um, bring those perspectives into decision making and into these valuation processes. So this is where this is where there's an interest in the more than human, um, particularly, which I, I think I, yeah I, I see in your work as well, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, there are also challenges to that, I suppose. Um, which I, yeah, I'm not sure if you maybe find any particularly re recurring challenges in your work along those lines. <laughs> so, um, as you said, you already brought up several uh, several points that show how complex and complicated these questions are. And one problem I think we all have to deal with from a philosophy perspective is the question about complexity, because the problems we are addressing are so complex that also the theoretical tools we need to make sense of these problems have to be very complex. And the problem usually is that often you know, non percentric theories, you know, fr from a, like a Western uh, modern uh, moral philosophy perspectives uh, usually didn't have these tools or you know, did have answers which were too simplified for the complexity of the questions they were supposed to answer. So this is definitely something which environmental philosophy in general is now struggling with because it is this challenge of complexity in while trying to be very inclusive of our worldviews, of our disciplines, and in entering in this dialogue, which makes the whole subject very exciting, but also extremely complex and difficult. But this is kind of the realm in which environmental philosophy nowadays is situated, which comes with its own challenges. Um, but I guess we, we share this problematic as far as you have been saying as well. I mean, what we seem to have both in common and what I guess a lot of environmental philosophers in one way or another are trying to achieve is bring this non anthropocentric perspectives into areas or different debates where they're usually not found. So can you maybe expand a little bit how that, you know, how your work is situated within this kind of new development? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so that kind of Moving away from anthropocentrism is, is, is I suppose, yeah, where we, uh, the commonality in our work. Um, so that's this moving away from the, the focus or the attention of moral consideration only, only to be um, based around humans, so our, our own sort of human interests. And the, the sort of uh, growing use of, of the frameworks like ecosystem services, um, nature's contributions to people, these frameworks have kind of been born from that economic. Um, e those economics um, perspectives where the consideration is to humans and, and human interests alone. But they are increasingly being developed and being sort of um, widened to become more um, inclusive of, of these plural values and of, of these more complex um, human nature relationships. So that's where some of the work I've, I've hoped to contribute um, to as, uh, as well and one of these ideas is this idea of life framework of values which is um builds on some of the environmental philosophers i think you sort of work with with john o'neill and this this idea, the idea of um uh, of looking at how the environment actually really matters to humans and of course there should we should never really forget this the core uh, fact that we depend on the environment we depend on nature um for our survival so there's this um but there are also other factors so there's this kind of four um fold frame that we we use which is this idea that we live we the environment matters because we live from it for our survival and we live in it for our kind of cultural activities and that is a sort of backdrop to our sort of quality of life and we also live with it so it's this recognition that we share the planet with with billions of other species um and uh, who live who've been on the planet before us and after us and that's this, this recognition that we're um one one of many species and there's also this recognition that we live as the environment as well. So this uh, awareness that there are other worldviews, like you sort of mentioned briefly, um, that don't necessarily see there's a distinction between um, people and nature. Um, so I think these kind of frameworks, um, though, though we often might get quite tired of all these frameworks that we're constantly hearing, 
sometimes they can be helpful just to just to kind of reframe the way that we um, then use the, the tools and the concepts that we're a bit more familiar with. Um, so they don't necessarily have to replace each other, but can be used sort of alongside each other. So that's some of the kind of, I suppose, interventions, which mm. um, I like to look at, look at, I suppose, yeah, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> Um, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Seb. So I really much relate to what you're saying there. And um, especially in terms of, you know, bringing this kind of making the sense of this non entrepreneurism in those broader frameworks and, you know, debates where it hasn't been put in before and how to integrate it in a way which makes sense without saying that this is now the only lens we have to look at, that this is one consideration out of many. So my own work is primarily meant uh, to address uh, other political philosophers because especially fear, fearist of justice because especially in this kind of context non entrepreneurism until very recently was something which was not integrated at all but now we see this political turn in environmental ethics and that is where i situate my work so in that sense my address the addressees of my work are very specific in terms of their fellow analytical political theorists and so in the terms of using the language that they use to explain how non entrepreneurialism can make sense within the way some people already look at the world so for people who it makes sense to speak in terms of justice and rights which are not all people but for some people those frameworks make sense to make moral sense of the world um, and so for there, I'm trying to explain how interspecies justice is something that makes theoretical sense and it should be one consideration, not necessarily the primarily one, but one consideration out of many that we need to take into account when we think about theorizing about justice. So what I think is important in these terms is that these are the addressees I'm trying to address with that so that there, the not the anthropocentric um, premises that are often very ingrained in this kind of tradition can be questioned. But obviously, I'm not claiming that everybody should think along those lines. But for the people that do, I try to argue that there are good reasons, reasons that you know should convince at least some people that we need to move away from purely anthropocentric ways of theorizing. And so there are different ways of you know, thinking about this. So you probably are also familiar with this, you know, ideas are surrounding living well with other species and so on. And so I was wondering what that means for you to think along those lines. Yeah, that's, thanks. That's good. Yeah, really good question. I think, um, I suppose there's actually what to answer that i think um and it's actually a question i was going to have for you i think which could be more more of um another sort of thing we have in common but is this idea that that the difference actually between ecological economics and environmental economics and there's kind of a, a core ontological shift between the two approaches which is um quite subtle actually i suppose and just the names sound, sound quite similar and often it kind of highlights how terminology is so important in these contexts because environmental and ecological as i explained to sort of friends and family uh, have a lots of different um connotations with them um but environmental economics very much takes this this idea that the the um economy is the whole and uh, or the the larger system and the the environment is a sort of subset of resources or a pool of resources that that we can use to varying levels of efficiency to support the economy whereas ecological economics switches that kind of ontology around and um, sees the environment or the, um, the environment as a the sort of large system, the economy as a subsystem within that. But what that then implies is these, it's a whole different way of looking at kind of relationships and the kind of interdependencies of humans and nature. So it's not like uh, necessarily as distinct categories, but there's this kind of um, recognition that there's all these complex and entangled ways in which humans and nature um, live with each other. Um, and so, that's the kind of the way that I think about living well and living well with other species really ties into this kind of focus on all these relations, relationships and, and all their kind of varying um, complexities, which I think are actually really important. And they're not just sort of economic questions, they're, they're, they're ethical questions really at the core as well. Um, so yeah. I just suggest so um, the other one, I, I noticed in your work as well, you talk about 
environmental um, uh, and ecological justice nexus. I'm wondering if, if what, what, what might be the difference between environmental justice and ecological justice in your work? Yeah, that's a very good question, especially because the way I personally use environmental and ecological justice differs quite a little bit from the way you speak of ecological and environmental economics. And so I see how some people might be confused by very similar terms being used very different in a different literature. So the way I use them and understand them, and I should note that a range of theorists talk about them differently, um, is basically two sides of one coin. So there's this new concept of planetary justice, where we can, you know, which is this idea about, you know, what justice on one planet means. And there we have a lot of different justice relationships, which are all part under this big heading. And part of that, the way I see it, are on the one side also environmental justice, which I understand as justice between people. So for instance, how can we justly share environmental resources as a typical environmental justice question. Um, on the other side, we have ecological justice or interspecies justice is maybe the better way of putting it to understand what I'm about is so how should we treat non human beings in a just way. So for instance, instance in uh, distributive terms, again, it means how do we justly share space on earth? So, you know, how much habitat should we protect in one way or the other to do interspecies justice to non-human beings? And so the way I see it, uh, ecological or interspecies justice on one side and environmental justice on the other side should be seen as two sides of one coin, you know, which is, the broader idea of planetary justice. So it's less of saying that um, ecological justice should um, surpass environmental justice. That is not the claim. It's something saying the question is rather how can we integrate environmental and ecological justice in a way that does justice to both? Um, and how can they function alongside each other? Because they're different relationships. So you also talked about relationships earlier. And for me, also coming from this kind of justice aspect, that's in the end the question. So, you know, how do we, from a justice perspective, interpret those relations we have with other humans and non-human beings on the earth? So those aspects of co-living, mutual accommodation, or especially in environmental ethics, usually we talk about interdependence of, you know, the community life. So, you know, those very broad ideas, you know, how can we interpret them in this kind of specific lens? This is where I'm kind of coming from. Um, yeah, but I mean, that is all very exciting, but also kind of brings me to ask you where you maybe want to go with your work now that you have focused very heavily on values and economic valuation, intrinsic values and so on. Now doing your PhD, I was wondering where you're thinking about going with that in the next few years. Um. So, yeah, so I've been looking at the relationships between um, people and water, um, but I'm also more and more interested in um, the kind of relationship between values and, and, and ontology that I've mentioned a couple of times, but looking at how worldviews can uh, affect our understandings of, of reality or, or what we might consider to be um, nature and, and how this kind of this relationship between people valuing um, and, and, and ontology. So that's, um, I suppose, kind of a more an ongoing um, project that I'd like to kind of develop on. So I suppose the context can obviously vary in that, in that, um, uh, with that kind of project in mind. But yeah, I think for the, for the short term, it's this this um, finishing my PhD and looking at um, how these kind of conversations, which, as we've mentioned, are quite complex and and um, and sometimes quite nuanced and how they can kind of also make sense to policy and decision making. So in flood risk management, it's, it's very kind of practical, practically focused. Um, so how can these kind of conversations be brought into that context is that's um, where I'm sort of interested at the moment. But what about yourself? What's your what do your ne next five years look like? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I asked you that question first, but it's a very big question, so it's difficult to answer. At the moment, despite that I've been 
speaking so far about the concept of justice a lot at the moment i'm actually looking at other questions on environmental ethics so especially during the next year i'm going to focus more on questions about which are a little bit more theoretical but i think which are very important to then inform those more broader questions so about moral standing of non-human beings how can we how can we theorize that in in a coherent way um unfortunately you know this is still a matter of considerable debate in environmental ethics and also i'm just recently part of a new project on the value of biodiversity which is also a very interesting area which is also still heavily debated about you know, what is really what we what do we really value about biodiversity and why diversity in itself is something we might want to protect um, and so, but then following up more in the future, I'm hoping to kind of come back to the global justice angle, but this time focusing a little bit more on global environmental justice, so justice between people in this context, um, to more look into those questions which I think are very important, but still in certain ways um, underdeveloped, especially if we think something like interspecies justice should also be considered, then based on that, how do we achieve better biodiversity protection in a fair way? Um, so how do we share the burden of such transformations justly in a world which is already marked by a multitude of complex injustices? And I think if those questions are not appropriately answered, and I mean, there is already a lot of interdisciplinary debate about these questions, um, which already shows how important it is to consider these. And this is just especially part of the kind of broad idea of trying to show how a global interhuman and interspecies justice can just be integrated in more ways. Um, this is, I hope, something I can go into a bit more in the future. But Sounds uh, great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, environmental ethics is a big, big, big area where a lot of things are happening right now and they need to happen, considering the big pressures to find ways of communicating and acting together. Um, so it's exciting. Um, and I really enjoyed hearing more about your work. So thank you very much. Oh, no, so yeah, I likewise really, really. I'm fascinated by a lot of your work and, and yeah so important like you said these kind of questions about environmental ethics and and taking the kind of focus away from these all being of sort of climate and ecological crisis being kind of technical problems but also this very um at its very basis and it's very core that these are kind of ethical questions as well mm -hmm. um so yeah i really enjoyed talking to you as well um and wish the best of luck for you as well thank you thank you